It's great that Google has, it's kind of a generic term now. And one of the things I'm going to talk to you about is a new study that we just did at UCLA uh, that is entitled Your Brain on Google. So I'm going to show you for the first time in history what your brain looks like when you search on Google. And um, I think you'll be interested to hear that. I, um, I have a background in neuroscience, and I'm also a psychiatrist. So if anything I say makes you particularly anxious, I can help you with that as well. Uh, and you know, I've been studying how the brain ages over the years. But in my own life, I've been struck uh, by the technology's effect on the brain. And this is really what uh, led to writing this book that uh, we'll be talking about and Google has made available for you. Uh, and the first point is we know it's changing our lives, but is it changing our brains? Well, I think it is. And a young person's brain is the most sensitive, spends the most time with it. And so what we have are a young group of digital natives who grow up with this technology, and then we have another group of digital immigrants that come to it later in life. And I think instead of a, I think we just lost our, uh, what's it? Is it coming back? So uh, it, instead of the, oops. See, this is something a middle-aged brain can't do is multitask, you know. <laughs> And we've got, I've got some data to prove it. You, know, if you, you have to shift tasks, it's a real problem. Uh, instead of a, a, a generation gap, we have what's called a brain gap. And what we're trying to do is bridge the brain gap, update the tech skills of the digital immigrants, and help the younger people with their face-to-face -face skills. Now, so this is a big topic. We, we have a, a much... What's that? Oh, they are? So do they want me to stop, or am I just hearing voices? And, no? <laughs> but there are people in the room, right? Yeah. So I should stop talking until they get connected? Uh, no. Okay, I'll keep going. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's, so our relationship with technology is personal. So I want to do, I know I don't have informed consent forms with all of you, but I'd like to do a little experiment. Now, I, I trust that all of you have a PDA or a cell phone, right? Have you turned it off? Gee, I, <laughs> well, what I'd like you to do is um, the first part of the experiment, usually in lectures we turn it off, but I guess Google, Google's a different culture. And so the first part of the experiment, I have people turn it on, and then they feel good. They smile, right? But let's do part two of the experiment. So I'm adjusting it for the Google environment. What I want you to do is take your cell phone and hand it to somebody near you, OK? Now, this usually makes people a little anxious and jittery, right? So we think, uh oh, you know, I just got that really cool device. So, they get a... so now, how do you feel, right? You feel kind of panicked and uncomfortable. Maybe, maybe if it's an old device, you don't care, right? Okay, now, now give it back. I don't want anybody to get into a panic attack. And now, what I'd like you to try to do. Now, this may be hard to do in your environment. Try turning it off. I see some anxiety on people's faces. Now, you should feel relaxed. I mean, there should be a point where we turn off the technology. And I think that's very important for us in this world. We, we have so much of it. Because what's happening? Our brains are very sensitive. Every moment, we stimulate our brains with uh, looking at a computer screen, looking at a book, hopefully this one, <laughs> or looking at a facial expression. Each of those experiences trigger a different cascade of neural events. The light comes into your eye, goes back to your retina, into the optic nerve. There are chemical reactions, neurotransmitters transport the information uh, across these neural networks. This is the basic building block. The neuron with long wires or axons that connect through synapses where the transmitters communicate. And it's all going on in the, in the brain, which is very specialized. In each area of the brain is specialized for different kinds of functions. Temporal lobe, there's, there's a memory and emotion. The back of the brain is vision. The frontal cortex is very important for complex reasoning. And it only weighs three pounds on average. Uh, a man's brain is a little bit heavier than a woman's brain. So, you know, when my wife asked me, does my brain look fat? I said, no, it looks great. It's nice and thin. And there's lots of information in there. There's 100 times a billion synapses in the average brain. So it's a very complex organ. If you see a word, if you say a word, if you generate a word, 
different areas of the brain. It's very specialized depending on how that word is processed. So you perceive an image or sensation. You may experience a feeling. You may have a memory from Woodstock if you went there or somewhere else. Or it can even trigger an automatic response, a muscle response, like a knee-jerk response. And it's all conveyed through these complex neural circuits. And we can measure what's going on with our new technology. I spent 20 years, 25 years doing this, using functional MRI, PET imaging, to look at what happens in the brain as it ages and what happens from moment to moment when we have these different experiences. And the brain is plastic. It's a, you can use the analogy of a computer, that you have basic programs built in, so you have the visual cortex and the parietal lobe, but then there's plenty of room for expansion on that so-called hard drive. And one basic principle is if we repeat a mental task, often those specific neural circuits are strengthened, and it may be at the cost of other mental tasks that we neglect. Our brains are malleable or changeable throughout life, especially the young brain is very quick to learn language and musical instruments, but it's not fully developed. The frontal lobe of the brain, where complex reasoning and decision making is made, is not yet fully developed. And adolescents do not have the kind of empathy skills that a middle-aged brain might have. They can't really perceive another person's emotional point of view as well as an older person. The other thing that happens during adolescence is that 60% of their synapses are pruned, or at least during early development in adolescence. So there's a lot of neural circuitry that is never developed and never used and actually pruned away. We have this other concept of evolution and brain evolution. And as we have evolved as a species, our brains have gotten larger. And so we have milestones in this evolutionary process. Years ago, when we developed a handheld tool, that was a major milestone. We figured out that you could use this rock as a tool, and complex reasoning and planning skills developed, grammatical language developed, social networking became more complex and elaborate, and the frontal lobe of the brain grew during that time period. The question is, with new handheld tools, what will the brain look like? So if you think about Darwinian's principle of natural selection, the genetic variations that adapt to the environment best will most likely survive. So you have some animals can reach for the leaves and they adapt. Other animals have shields, pachyderms on their skin. Some blend in with their surroundings and adapt to their environment. So this was the environment that our brain adapted to hundreds of thousands of years ago. What will our brain look like in this environment? And that's the a big question that iBrain is asking. And this is what is happening with evolution. It's turning upside down. This may be the modern species in the future. Now let's ask a question. How much time does the average young person spend with technology? How many of you think it's two hours a day? How about three and a half hours? OK. What about five and a half hours? OK, a few more. How about seven hours? How about eight and a half hours? Well, eight and a half hours is the right answer. So there's a tremendous amount of time. Our environment is changing with young people, and they're spending more and more time with technology. The breakdown of daily technology is seen here, whether it's passive or interactive. 97% of children 12 to 17 play games on computers, consoles, or handheld devices. So it's completely penetrated to these young people, what we call digital natives, who grow into this technology, don't have as much time with face-to-face -face communication. The digital immigrants have more time when they're growing up. How will this affect brain development? This is a big question. Are those numbers internationally valid? Or just US? Those are US numbers, OK? So it's probably changes, differs from uh, country to country. You know, talk about international. One country where there's a, a big concern is China with video game addiction. They actually have specific treatment centers for teens who are hooked on video games. We don't have it in this country. Usually those kids are going to other rehab addiction centers for other kinds of habits, and they deal with the technology there. Now, uh, how many of you would define yourself as digital natives? Anybody here? No? OK. So how many times a day do you check your Facebook or MySpace? Once a day? Three to five times a day? More than 10 times a day? 
So now we have kind of a small group here, but often uh, young digital natives spend a lot of time all day checking with their social network. It's a very powerful force in their lives. A New York Times article, slow down, brave multitasker, and don't read this in traffic. Another article in the Wall Street Journal was about the generation text. And one person talked about how you can avoid an accident when you text uh, while walking if you um, keep your chin at a 45 degree angle, you're less likely to walk into a tree or a post. <laughs> now, with all this technology around, people are getting addicted to it. And the same brain circuitry involved in any addiction, the, the dopamine circuits get charged up. And you have your anterior cingulate, the frontal circuits, the voice of reason trying to balance that. But it becomes a problem. Some people are shopping online. Other people are gambling online. Uh, and there are people uh, very involved in virtual games, second life. There are people who spend 12, 14 hours a day with their avatar, and they're neglecting their real life experience, and it's becoming problematic. If you don't have a full-blown tech addiction, uh, many of us are very much drawn to the lure of email. It's there all the time, and it follows these basic principles of operant conditioning. This is what psychologists call it, that the behavior is reinforced by the consequence. So if this represents an email, most emails, it's you know, boring or some work task you don't want to do, or it's spam and you get this and this, and then all of a sudden you get this. And it's a great message. Somebody finally responded to that question you had, or you, you won some money or something like that, or you got a raise. Well, that one email keeps reinforcing it. And you go on and on and on. You keep looking for that great experience. It's much more powerful than if every single email were a happy face or good experience. So this is the kind of thing that really compels us to get hooked on various technologies. And it's, it's always there. It's a bit like a food addiction. We need to have food. To, in this day and age, we need to use the technology. And somehow, we need to find a way to manage it. One of the uh, ideas in, in iBrain is that with so much time on technology, we're neglecting the human contact skills. And a recent study supported that, where they had uh, volunteers play violent video games before they did uh, this task, where they looked at a face. And they watched this face morph from a neutral expression to either an angry expression or from a neutral expression to a happy expression. And what they found is when they played the video games, there was a reduction in their ability to quickly recognize the happy expression, suggesting that indeed we're neglecting those neural circuits that train us in recognizing human emotional expression. Yes? Which video games were they playing? That, uh, you know, I'd have to look at the article. To, you're testing my hippocampus, and I don't have that. Yeah. That's in your hippocampus. Well, it's, uh, well in my memories. Now, that's, a, that's an excellent point. And because what people tend to do, they tend to overgeneralize. They think, what, OK, give me the bottom line. What are video games doing to the brain? And it's not so simple. It depends on the type of game. It depends on the duration of use. It depends on how it's being used. You know, For example, I've seen my son engage in these video games. And he's got a, a microphone on. He's got his friends there. And it's a very interactive social experience. So I think we've got, we really have to look at that in addition there are now computer technologies that actually train the brain to, to perform better different types of skills. Yeah? Um, with regard to uh, what children are, uh, uh, are adults are uh, growing up like once they're surrounded by, uh, by technology, I think maybe the most more salient point is not how are they growing up differently because they're surrounded by technology, but because the, the technology evolves at a compressed rate, the fact that they are, that their environment is changing so rapidly from year to year as they're growing up. Yeah, you know, I think that that's another excellent point. It's, you know, you know what the, these young digital natives are adapting to this changing environment, and, they, and they're very comfortable with it. I mean, they will, you know, get the new device in a moment. They'll pick it up very quickly, and their brains have wired for that and adapted to it. I think with the traditional generation gap, now the brain gap, there tends to be value judgments that get involved. So, you know, I talk to schools, and the parents are concerned, how can my kid be doing their homework when they're multitasking, they're listening to their iPod, they're video conferencing. And I say, well, how are their grades in school? Maybe they're doing just fine. Look at the outcome 
as something that, to measure whether they're succeeding or not. So I think you know that is a rapidly changing environment. And the question is, what will happen? Yes. Well, in this particular study, it was a violent video game that they tested. They didn't look at different types of video games. And this is one of the problems in the literature, is that there's an emphasis on violent video games. And most of the literature looks at its uh, association with aggressive behavior rather, what's, rather than what's going on in the brain. There have been a few studies looking at brain functional changes with video games, and you have mixed results. Some, result, some findings are that the frontal lobe has less activity. Some findings show there's more activity. Are there really enough controls on these studies to make them useful to generalize? Well, I think it's, you have to be very careful in how you're generalizing because it's uh, a new area of research. There's not a lot of, uh, not a lot of study that's been done. And one of the problems with the small sample is that there may be bias in who you're choosing. Now, I'm going to show you a study in a moment where it is a small sample, but we did have controls, and we did see some interesting results. But let me get to that in a moment. Another concern is attention deficit problems. There have been many studies showing an association between worse symptoms of ADHD and watching television or playing video games. And it's concerned the American Academy of Pediatrics enough so that they now recommend no television and video games for children under two. Now, people will argue that there's not an absolute causal relationship that's been established. In fact, people with ADHD may be drawn to those technologies, uh, and it might not be the other way around. So we have what's been termed the text generation. So I, just to test to see how good you are at this, let's see, do you know, what does this stand for? Okay. You didn't get that one. Great minds think alike. Get a life. That's something my daughter would send to me. How many of you have teenagers? Anybody? No? Okay, well, that's a good thing. This is parent when you are when you have a teenager, you may see this message. Message, parents are watching, and I love you. And then we have emoticons, you know, the happy face. This is the startled face. This is Elvis Presley, and this is John Lennon. And, you know, if you look at, if you get a message, if you read something in a book and it conveys some information, or if you read an emoticon and get the same message, there's a completely different part of your brain that is triggered. So our brains are sensitive to these messages. Uh, there's evidence that we're spending less time reading books. Literary reading has gone down, more time with the technology. Uh, less time outdoors, less time with nature. So there is a shift in how we're spending our time, what we're exposing our brains to. Some people have talked about the fractured family. Here you see a family where the kids are online and the parents are reading more traditional uh, types of information. And the digital immigrants who come to technology more reluctantly, their brains are older, they're slower to learn, reaction time is slower. Uh, they are showing memory problems even in middle age. And their sensory motor function may be a little worse than someone who's younger. So they have trouble with the small technologies in responding to that. So now some of you may not remember these technologies, but this was, this was a, a real revolution when I was a kid, a color television or an IBM Selectric 2 typewriter. Or uh, the term dial a number comes from the old dial phones. This is the, the first cell phone. These were good, and then you had the first video game, Pong, and then Betamax was the format we were all supposed to adopt. We know from various studies that as people get older, they're less likely to use technology. And um, also their brains age. This is a study that we did with our new PET brain imaging uh, technique where we can actually see the physical evidence of Alzheimer's disease building up in the brain and this is uh, the temporal lobe, the uh, frontal lobe, where there's a lot of memory centers. And as the memory score gets worse, you see a buildup of these problems or abnormal plaques and tangles. So an older brain is less likely uh, to be able to adapt to these technologies, yet probably if you're a digital immigrant, you're going to be checking your email quite a bit. And many of the concerns that digital natives have in terms of too much technology, digital immigrants are experiencing experiencing as well. 
So they're multitasking. Studies show that they cannot multitask as efficiently as a younger person. There are more errors when we multitask, even though there is a perception that we're performing better. People complain of digital fog, and there's a memory decline in old age. Now, uh, this is a study I was uh, teasing you a moment ago, your brain on Google. And what we did, a group of us, uh, got some money from a local foundation, and this is in press in uh, one of the academic journals. We looked for people who had minimal, if any, prior computer experience, middle-aged and older people. They were hard to find. Congratulations, you're the last person on earth to get an email account. They're out there. We found them and we matched them up with what we called an, an internet or net savvy group. And we wanted to find out what the brain looked like when it searched on the internet. So uh, this uh, is a small sample, as we discussed earlier, but they were very well-matched groups in terms of age, educational achievement, uh, mostly female. They only differed in terms of their prior computer use, internet use, and their self-rating of internet experience. And we used functional MRI to find out what was going on in their brain while they uh, searched online, at least in a simulated environment. And functional MRI allows us to see where the brain is working from moment to moment. And this is what the machine looks like. If you've never seen or been inside an MRI scanner, you can see it's a very narrow tube. You can't get a computer in there. So what we did was we used these specialized goggles that allow us to present different images. And we had a control image to control for paying attention. We said, just look at this bar. Then we had a reading text page. And we had the volunteers. We gave them tests after the experiment. So uh, they were motivated to gather the information. They could get it from a text page or from a searching task where they had to make a choice of which site looked like the best site to get the information. And they had a little keypad next to their uh, hand where they could operate the cursor to do the internet search task. And basically, this is what we found. We found the net naive people, when they were reading the book, they activated this back part of the brain, the visual cortex, and areas that control memory and reading and language. When we had them searching on the internet, there was a similar constellation of activations. When the net savvy people looked at the book page, again, a sim similar pattern. But the big difference was when the net savvy people were searching for the information. You can see a much greater extent of activity throughout the brain, and particularly in the frontal lobe, which is the area that is involved in complex reasoning and decision making. So this is your brain on a book, and this is your brain on Google. Much different picture. So what does that mean? Well, you know, you can interpret this in many different ways, and, and the, the headlines are, you know, Google is making you smart. Now, I, you know, maybe it is. I don't know. I mean, it's, uh, it's certainly activating neural circuits. And uh, we're trying to understand this better. It's the second part of the experiment, and you can read about it in iBrain, uh, and we haven't yet published this part, is we took these two groups of people, the savvies and the naives, and we gave them five days of practice. So we had the uh, control of the, uh, the, the savvies continuing, and then we wanted to see if we could train the brains of the naives, and we found that the savvies, baseline and follow-up, there was not much difference. But the naives, after just five days, we started triggering these neural circuits in the frontal part of the brain, suggesting that the brain can train itself very quickly to learn this task. So what I think is going on uh, is when we are presented with a novel mental task, our brains don't quite know what to do, and so there is not a lot of brain activation. Once we figure out the strategy, the neural circuits fire up, and we engage those neural circuits. And it may be that Searching is a task that continuously uh, we can pace ourselves to make it interesting enough and exciting enough so that we keep activating those circuits. When it becomes repetitive, we generally see less activity and we interpret that as cognitive efficiency. So in a sense, the brain can lift more weight using less energy. And there's a lot of uh, tools out there uh, 
new computer programs trying to exercise an older person's brain. We have a brain boot camp at UCLA to help people with their memory, and we've got memory courses throughout the country that are very popular. But there's also a question as to whether the technology is weakening our memory. How many phone numbers do you remember? Most people don't remember their phone numbers because it's all in their uh, PDAs. They don't have to remember it. Does relying on your PDA shrink your hippo hippocampus? And you might ask yourself, where did I leave my brain? I can't remember any of this stuff. What I say to people is, you know, we want to pick and choose what we commit to our biological memory. You want to remember names and faces. You don't want to have to look at your handheld device to say hello to your uh, office mate, Frank. Uh, but, you know, you don't need to remember his birth date and his anniversary because that can be in your PDA. What about the, some of the upsides of the technology? Well, we know it can help surgeons. Surgeons who play video games make fewer errors in the operating room. And studies have found that it improves attention span. It can improve reaction time. There's a program that improves peripheral vision. There's actually, uh, I think, Allstate Insurance is making this program available to people, older drivers, to help them with their driving skills. We also know that offline training will make a difference with the brain. And we can uh, show that the amygdala, the emotional center of the brain, can uh, have different neural circuitry patterns from psychotherapy. Uh, we found that training the brain offline uh, can affect the prefrontal cortex. And so what we want to do is understand these various brain responses to our technology environment as well as our offline environment and try to upgrade the skills of people who need it, try to help younger people with their social skills, and also try to innovate with technology. Make sure we spend time with other people and with nature. We want to manage the technology to preserve our humanity and not the other way around. So before I close and give you a chance to ask some questions, I just wanted to speculate a little bit about the future brain because there's some really interesting research right now in brain-computer interface technology where people can actually control the computers just by thinking about it and having sensors hooked up to their heads. So this may be the student of the future with one of these headpieces. And there's actually now a new company that uh, claims to have the first commercially available brain-computer interface. So you can now play your favorite video game without having to get um, uh, you know, trigger finger from operating the cursor. And the future brain may look like this, where instead of wearing a Bluetooth device, we'll have a little sensor. And if you want to meet your friend for coffee, you just think about it. That thought will be transmitted to your laptop, which goes by Wi-Fi to your friend's PDA. And then you meet them for coffee. And of course, you'll have to wear tinfoil hats to pe keep people from reading your mind as you walk down the street. Yeah, so, it, what's that? You already have that? <laughs> Can you imagine the spam that would hit you as you walk down the street? Uh, let me see what it is. It's called Emotive. E M O T I V E P O C. You can get that online. So, technology is not only changing our lives, it's changing our brains. We've got a new generation gap, the brain gap, but I think we can balance our lives and bridge that brain gap by improving the technology and the social skills and knowing when to use them. And if you want some more information, uh, visit my website, drgarysmall.com. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, yeah, you were first. Go ahead. Well, I think, you know, there's a, a couple of uh, reasons for that uh, that I think it's important right now. One, that we can study it in more detail, that we have the technologies to really try to understand it. Uh, secondly, uh, it just seems intuitive to me that there's something that is tremendously powerful about the technology we have today, that it, it, it really it's kind of thrust things into high gear. 
and, and it means there's tremendous opportunity, but potentially uh, risks as well if we don't understand it. So I think those, I mean, those are certainly were phenomenal effects on the brain and on uh, brain evolution. Just the handheld tool was a huge effect. So, you know, our brains are changing from moment to moment. Uh, the good news is that a lot of the, most of this is not permanent in an individual. We can really help people and change the neurocircuitry uh, and change it back, so to speak. Um, no, you had a question. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, first of all, it seems to me that if this was released as a searchable DVD or a CD, then it would be better for people reading it than reading this book, right? Because then if we're working this way, well, I think we should have a DVD version so we could actually make it kind of as a search engine. You can kind of right. get the information that way. So, the, so that leads me to the real question, which is that um, we're constantly working to improve our search results, and, and people say sometimes, gee, I wish that you would just give me the one result I want. And, you know, of course, we, we can't read their minds yet. Um, but it seems to me that the more we improve our search results, the, we're doing a disservice What a great question. So I think, um, yeah, no, I, you know, I think we don't know the answer to that. Uh, I think, you know, we often talk about brains like, or computers are like brains and vice versa. And I think whatever we do, there will be an adaptive response. So I think uh, somebody here mentioned the changeability and how the young digital natives are adapting very well to a changing environment. I think this is the same phenomenon. I, I think that, you know, what we tend to do with the search engines the way they are, we sort of pace ourselves at our own level. We'll go as fast or as slow as we feel comfortable. We, I think we saw this with our brain on Google study where the digitally naive people, uh, they didn't quite get it at first, but very quickly they picked on, up on it. So uh, when you're, uh, I think our brains are ready for it. Whatever you want to throw at us, we'll take it to the next level, which I think makes it a little bit scary, but uh, kind of exciting about what the future brain will really look like. Yeah. So you told us that uh, looking at, at search results does not activate the brain uh, in a manner similar to reading. Could you compare it to other activities? Is there anything that does have a similar activation pattern? To, for search results? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I think we, we don't have the answer to that. This was the first study of its kind, and we just used the book page um, control as a, as a task. We really need to ask that question. We need a whole body of study to understand that, um, which I don't know if that's something of interest to Google, to really look at, uh, you probably look at behavior a lot, whether you look at brain functional patterns, I don't know if you've done studies like that. I think it would be very interesting just uh, if it could lend any insight into what people are doing, what, what it is about the search engine that makes them activate so much more of their brain, you may be able to get better information perhaps about what, in, what they're missing. So if they're activating the problem solving Brains right. that will hypothesize it's because they don't have some information that they want when they make a decision. They're yeah. trying to solve some sort of puzzle or answer some question. Yeah. And they're deducing information from those results that if it is simply presented, it's easier. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, this, we're all part of this process. I think, you know, your, your job is to make those search engines better and better, to respond to your customer. What the customer will do is they'll like that, and then they're going to want more and more and more, and the process will continue to evolve. I was just talking with a journalist, and uh, they were talking about a new software that now is instantaneous. You don't have to wait for, you probably know about this, you don't have to wait for the program to boot up. You know, when you have the handhelds, right away you see your email. And a lot of times on the desktop, it takes time to boot up the programs. And so it, it brings up the idea that, in a way, the, our brains are craving for this. And rather than, I've been talking a lot about how our brains are adapting to the technology. Here the technology is adapting to what the brain wants. And so it's an interactive process. Yeah.
Right. Well, you, yeah, I think because the science is in its infancy, and, th and this is just what uh, people, of, uh, pediatricians and psychologists have observed. That's what they decided to look at, and they clump them together. But you're absolutely right. They're very different uh, mental activities. I mean, I've actually heard myself say to my son, Harry, get off that video game and come downstairs and watch television with me. You know, and so what I was expressing was my anxiety that he was spending too much time with the video game, that I was concerned it was too much of a repetitive activity. I wanted him to socialize more. Maybe there was something about the program that I wanted. So, you know, it's a basic principle of neuroscience or brain science that it's probably good for the brain to vary activities. It's this idea of cross-training. And, uh, you know, we don't know for sure, but it's something that, that seems to make sense. So, but, but that's, a, that's a good point. There's too much clumping. We really need to understand it better, what's going on. I think you had a question? Yeah. yeah um, you mentioned potential problems, including uh, addiction and atrophying of social skills. Are we seeing any evidence of other direct physiological changes that we should be worried about? Well, you know, I think it, there's just the practical problems. I mean, a lot of people get eye strain. They get uh, neck ache. They get, um, uh, you know, problems with their wrists and their fingers from overuse. So I think there's those kinds of problems. There's certainly associations between uh, being overweight, uh, you know, not getting enough exercise because we're so drawn to the technology. So I think, again, uh, it's the issue of balance in our lives to try not to overuse it, but, uh, you know, use it in a way that enhances our everyday life. Another question. Uh, you, you talked a bit about developmental changes due to technology's presence, but that seemed to lump young people all together as being technologically savvy. I mean, are we seeing differences in groups of young people between those who are heavier users of technology or who use it in different ways? Uh, you know, there, that hasn't been studied as systematically as, as we probably like, but sure, there's going to be variation within each of these groups, and you can even take the, the natives and the immigrants and subgroup them further. I mean, there's the millennials, there's uh, just lots of different subgroups or cohorts of people that have different uh, value systems that can be generalized and kind of respond differently uh, in terms of their own emotional reaction to the technology, how they use it, how they interact with it. Okay, well, thank you for uh, your, your questions, and if you'd like me to sign your books, I'd be happy to do that, and we can uh, talk for a few minutes afterwards. Appreciate your time.